and welcome to the Serpent Temple podcast. I am today joined by a special guest artist, Laguz. Is it Laguz Likamo? Is that yes. How you say it? Yeah. yeah. Laguz, 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 Laguz Likamo. It doesn't really matter, you know. However. Well, this is Laguz. Or as you say on your Instagram, Laguz the Time Wizard, which yeah. I really appreciate. Um, so, yeah, this is. We usually have musicians, but I want more artists on the podcast. And I'm really happy you're the first artist because I love your work. Thank you. I adore it. Um, I first found you on Instagram like f three or four years ago, I think, yeah, quite a probably. while back. Yeah. So it's amazing to actually have you here in the flesh, mm. in real life. Um, so thank you for coming. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. It is um, a pleasure. We were gonna, we can do a side card reading if you like. That'd um, be cool, yeah. But we'd love to first ask you about your art as well, because okay. um, we have some on the table. You just surprised me with this amazing mm. image that you have have made that's made my day that is based on um a picture of me so thank you because i'm going red again it's really beautiful um you do a lot of like high fantasy stuff with like cool creatures and people and colors um and it's kind of cool to have you here today because yesterday i don't know if you saw but when the the director of the heavy metal film died oh yes i, I saw on your uh, instagram story yeah. yeah and a lot of your work reminds me not completely because it's like a different style but the, the sort of some of it reminds me of like heavy metal like yeah. the kind of empowered female um element of your work which i love so yeah yeah <laughs> well definitely i grew up you know uh very inspired by all the traditional fantasy, uh, either books, um, heavy metal was a, a big influence as well, even though I couldn't get many in Costa Rica, you know, it, it, at the time it was kind of like, you know, satanic, and uh, <laughs> even though my mom didn't care, she would get me whatever she could find, um, but yeah, there, there's one of my favorite artists, uh, Luis Royo, uh, he used to publish a lot in heavy metal, um, and that was kind of, growing up was my goal, like, oh, I want to be as good as as him, um, but yeah, anything in heavy metal was was very influential. So you know, even though my my idea of death, like I I don't find it so like a sad thing happening. Um, especially you know, artists, they live through their work. Mm -hmm. So you know, for me, it's like oh, go go on, go move into your uh, fantasy realms that you created. That's what I believe. Like once I die, transcend this reality. I'm creating my own place with all these fairies and kind of like Pan's Labyrinth esque a little yeah. bit, yeah. <laughs> and I'll just go, you know, chill there for a while after all this human human experience. And so happy for him, you know. Yeah. yeah. What a world to transcend into. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. Dragons, fairies, magic. Sounds sounds cool. <laughs> yeah. Well, you've created one for your own to transcend into yeah. for yeah. sure. Yours is, I feel, um, probably a safer realm to exist in. Um, you know, it, it feels, for me, like this realm is going to be a vacation. I had a lot of struggles here. Uh, even though I feel like we need the drama and the struggle to keep the, the mind engaged, mm. uh, interested, or like, you know, so it doesn't bore us to death. Um, I still feel like I, I like a little bit of a vacation in a realm where everything's more into like a little bit hedonistic, yeah. you know, just for the pleasure. Hmm. Yeah. So it, it's actually called the Hidden Garden. Uh, so the, not the Eden, the Garden of Eden, the Garden of Hidden. So it's <laughs> all about pleasure. That's perfect. Yeah. yeah. That's so yeah, everybody, cool. everybody's invited. Yeah. After, like after your lives as humans. You can all come. <laughs> <laughs> we're down, we're down, yeah, we're in. Definitely. Yeah, but that's really interesting because it's quite rare um, in like this contemporary age to have artists that like kind of believe in almost like a platonic idea of, of their work, of like there being this additional realm where it really mm. does exist. And I think that's really beautiful. And there are, I mean, there's a musician, um, Neige from Alcest, who like genuinely believes in the world that he, he creates um, musically. Mm -hmm. as well um and it's like something that he's had since childhood and there's another artist too um seb mckinnon he has a similar deal where like you know him and his brothers had like an, an entire world they inhabited together mm -hmm. as children that they also bring to life so it's really i think that's like we should celebrate yeah um, and i really like that i think we are too like rooted in, in um our senses yeah. and sort of 
being too mechanical in how we think about yeah. art. So yeah, it's really refreshing mm. to, to hear that perspective. Yeah, well, uh, I came to it um, after years and years of, you know, I, I love since I was a kid, my first like interested interest in into like a spirituality or like this hidden like this beyond the physicality uh it was when i was a kid i was just playing with my ninja turtles my mom was flipping channels and she <laughs> nice. stopped on star wars and it's, it was the scene where yoda is training luke <laughs> yeah. and he tells him like oh, we're like we're not these physical bodies like we're beings of light and that immediately caught my attention my attention and like I want to know more. Like I want to know. I want to be this old uh, guy, you know, <laughs> that knows stuff. Like, what are we? Um, so, so since since I was very young, I started reading everything I could into like all this metaphysical stuff, and that took me, you know, through many religions, many philosophies, and eventually it landed me on because you know the the logical mind, mm -hmm. and especially in this era, it's you know it. Everything is physical. Everything is Newtonian uh, mechanics, and eventually, now with quantum mechanics, that's where science kind of met uh, consciousness. And from the Eastern side of uh, philosophy, like Buddhism, Taoism, uh, they like from consciousness, from meditations, from like observing the world, they came into consciousness. So that's where philosophy and science kind of met mm -hmm. and now a lot of things are making sense like, and that was for my logical mind the the permission to believe these things that for a long time I felt like no I have, I'm, I'm just crazy I'm I'm insane mm -hmm. uh, for a long time I felt like I should just walk into a you know a mental hospital and be like hey guys uh, I think I, I belong here <laughs> because <laughs> I have all these uh, crazy ideas, and I talk to fairies and the trees, and uh, I don't know, that's, that's crazy. Um, but yeah, now I'm feeling way better, and I feel like if we actually live in, a, in an illusion, within an illusion, that that's the main idea of all these Eastern philosophies, the world is mental, the, the universe is mental, it's an illusion within an illusion, a dream, then anything goes, like anything that you can imagine it exists somewhere, um, and definitely you can travel there by some means of consciousness. And the more I believe this, and the more I practice things like uh, lucid dreaming, uh, the more I get these very strong experiences of the world being way more than just these physical experiences. Um, and even in waking life, I start experiencing things that, like, wow, that that it really happen uh, that keep proving me again and again that yes this, there's there's more than just you know Newtonian reality and cause and effect um, so yeah why not you know and even if I'm wrong I'm, I'm having a great time just <laughs> drawing fairies and what not it's yeah. fun yeah. yeah it's beautiful you know if it makes you happy just yeah right why not? who cares did you follow like a certain like process to get into lucid dreaming? Like, was there something like, um, cause I've been read like a few ways of like attempting to get into it. And it, there seems to be like a, a few contradictory like methods of attaining it. I suppose it just depends on you as a person, right? It, you know, for some people, just as anything else, for some people, it comes easier uh, than others. Uh, there's definitely a lot of practices to get into to, you know, better your chances of lucid dreaming. Uh, the basic one that, you know, everybody's going to tell you, it's have your dream journal. The first thing you got to do in the morning when you wake up is write your dream. Even if you don't remember anything, you write, I remember nothing. Because what you want to create first is the habit and the conscious um idea that the first thing I, I wake up, I got to remember my dream. My, like The mind is going to hold on to that so you can pour it on the pages because uh, dreams vanish real fast unless it's something very intense um, that sometimes wakes you up because of how emotionally it gets. Either it can be a nightmare or maybe sometimes you're having way too much fun in a dream and you wake up. 
and then that sticks in your mind uh, longer. But most of the time you wake up and you get out of bed, immediately the dream is gone. So the first thing and the most important basic thing is have your dream journal. And then the other thing that is very um, basic is have your dream check as in your waking life. Because you want to create a habit where you're constantly checking if you are in a dream. And this can be anything. You can, like, for most people, it has to be that something that's with you all the time. So the most basic uh, practice is look at your hands. And if anything looks weird, then you're probably dreaming. Uh, some people pull their, their finger and sometimes, you know, it comes stretches off, yeah. or whatever yeah. happens. <laughs> like, oh, I'm dreaming. Um, for me, it's I, I look at my tattoos. And if they say something, then I know I'm dreaming because ah. I like it. It'll, to me, like the dream will talk to me in tattoos. So I have a key. It, it says hello because the first time that it actually triggered in the dream and I looked, it said hello. So I knew the dream was uh, talking to me like, hey, hello, you're dreaming. Yeah. Um, so I got it now tattooed in my skin because my practice now changed. I don't check anymore if I'm dreaming. I'm telling my mind. I'm always dreaming. So now the practice is not to check if I'm dreaming or I'm awake, because that brings a separation. I'm reminding myself all the time, hey, you are dreaming. And then, you know, that brings a different state of mind. Uh, it, it led to some weird dreams, because, um, you know, then now... In my dreams, sometimes I start doing weird shit. And it doesn't trigger the lucid dream. Like, oh, I'm in a dream. I just believe, like, yeah, you know, it's normal. I, of course I can fly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, this yeah. is me. Um, because that's, that's one of my main things in dreams. It's uh, flying. Like, as soon as I know I'm dreaming, it's like, oh, it's, it's time to fly. Um, but now, I'm like, more than, you know, Lucid dreaming is beautiful. It's one of the best experiences I've had. I've taken all the substances that I've been able to get my hands on, ayahuasca, LSD, DMT, yeah. like, great. Nothing like a dream. Like, there's no drug that is going to submerge you into, like, these 3D, fully sensorial experience like a dream. Yeah. So, definitely recommend it. There's a book. It has all the practices. Um by this guy that he's been researching lucid dreaming for over 30 years. Uh, so definitely recommend it. It's called Lucid Dreaming, A Gate Gateway into the Inner Self by uh, Robert Wagner. And usually as you're reading the book, uh, it'll trigger a lucid dream because your mind is constantly, really? you yeah. know, feeling it and thinking about it and think about the practices and you, you try to develop like, oh, what am, what am I going to choose? Uh, for my reality check and having that mind constantly thinking about it is what triggers the, the lucid dream so yeah definitely definitely. Yeah, I, I would definitely check that out yeah well one of the most interesting experiences I ever had was um, and I wasn't aware I was dreaming at the time was um, when you look at a mirror in the dream it's it's your brain's reconstruction of what your face looks like mm -hmm. so oftentimes it's quite distorted so I think it's quite especially for people that have like body dysmorphia it could be mm -hmm. quite a, a freaky thing to do but I remember actually woke me up with socks. I looked in the mirror and my face was like so contorted and I was just like, fuck. So yeah, okay. it's, uh, I just thought it was just such a cool thing. I, I felt like that was just like a gateway into my soul. Cause I was just like, this is how my brain sees my face. And it was just really bizarre. Yeah. yeah quite cool. I mean, like it's uh, dream experiences are, are very, uh, interesting. Uh, I have a friend that she doesn't like dreaming. Like every time she knows she's dreaming, she wakes herself up. So, uh, cause she's like, well, like it's wasted time, which to me is like, what? what? Like, you know, yeah. what are you doing? You're sleeping. What wasted time? Why do you want to wake up and work? You know, have your fun. Um, but then like every time she realizes, so she's always checking when things start to go weird. She's like, oh, am I dreaming? Uh, so she thought about the, the mirror and she went to look into the mirror and like, oh, it looked normal. And then a friend came into the room and said hi in a very different way to like what her personality is. So that kind of triggered like, ah, yeah. okay. and she asked her like, is this a dream? 
and her friend just started laughing. And when she turned back to look into the mirror, she said like everything started melting, oh. and this like the creepy uh, circus song came no. in like. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <shit. laughs> She's like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm turning. <laughs> So I, I think like the subconscious or, you know, if the uh, the dream realms are, you know, it's just the whole universe uh, talking to you. Um, it has a, a fun, twisted uh, sense of humor, which I also find, uh, you know, in, in waking life. It, you know, if once you start to develop that relationship with the universe and you start to actually talking to the universe and asking for things and you find out that, it has a weird sense of humor. I mean, sometimes it just plays jokes on you and you gotta just laugh it. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. I found out me and a friend of mine have a shared dream. Oh, yeah. So we have cool. a, a dream where it's like an anxiety dream. We have a dream where we're pulling like a really big, thick length of rope out of our throats. <laughs> and it's like this weird gray, spongy material. And it's like exactly, it was weird because we both, it tastes and feels the same for both me and my mm. friend. We have this exact same anxiety dream so there's some like weird Jungian thing where people have this like rope dream where you're just like pulling it out of your body and you just can't God. it won't stop coming out it's really yeah. weird and like really but I, I have a lot of lucid dreams and the first thing I do is I fly to Hawaii and I eat loads of cake because <laughs> cake tastes really good in, dreams. in lucid yeah, dreams Hawaii. you just like literally just Hawaii. like Matilda <laughs> just getting fistfuls of cake and you just oh it's great nice. this one Shem wakes you up and tells you to stop eating the fluff and the pillow <laughs> <laughs> just chomping yeah. through the sheets yeah. then you have to pull off this like, yeah. rope yeah. Of, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah I used to like every time I lose a dream like oh what, what do I do now like where do I go because at the beginning it's that idea of like um, you're controlling the dream which you're not you have a little bit more of like uh, you know it's like being on a ship now you know like oh I can kind of go there but they're still like you're in the ocean and the ocean is doing its thing. Um, so now what I do, like every time I lose a dream, I just tell the dream, like, just take me whatever, like you show me what you need to show me, what I need to be shown. Because I take uh, dream practice as a way of um, mental health um, practice. Um, so when you're in your dreams working directly with your subconscious and you manage, manage to shift something there, like it's going to seep into your conscious mind really easily because you, you, you're working with the root instead of like trying to get like, why am I like, why this trauma, why this fear, why this insecurity? And, uh, Rumi used to said the, the tree doesn't resemble the seed. And that's where you need to go, like to the seat of mm -hmm. your trauma. And once you manage to shift something there, you know, it's going to uh, transform your conscious mind completely. So now every time I lose a dream, like I just ask the dream, like, OK, take me. And usually I start just floating and it takes me to like the most magical amazing experiences like i start traveling to black holes into different earth dimensions oh, wow. uh yeah i go into the ocean um and sometimes like you know you get scared because of the same idea that i'm a physical body you know it's very ingrained into the mind uh so you know i start floating and leaving the earth i'm like oh i can't breathe on space i'm like i'm in a dream you know mm -hmm. you don't need to breathe you don't need to breathe air oxygen but the act of conscious breathing calms the mind, even if you don't need oxygen. Like, even if I'm on, under the ocean, I actually start breathing, so it'll calm my mind, and that's where the magic, you know, happens. Um, and I've even tried this in, you know, waking life, when I do uh, breathing exor exercises, especially uh, retention. When I'm like getting to that point that oh, fuck, I need I need to breathe, I need oxygen. I just remember the dream and like no, you don't need. Just imagine that you're breathing, and that actually extends your like time that you don't need to to actually breathe. Um, so yeah, it, you know some of these dream practices start to have a very practical effect on my waking life because same like. I'm getting scared, I'm getting anxious, I'm getting worried in waking life. And I remember like, just just breathe and let the universe take you whatever 
you need to be. So it becomes this constant trust in life, in the universe, in the process, in you know, not needing to control everything, um, which is actually what started me in watercolor uh, painting. It used to be very hard for me. I used to do oil, and oil, you have all the control in oil, you know. Yeah. And you can come back to it and do layers and layers and layers until it's perfect and exactly what you want it. Uh, watercolor, you know, it's going to do its thing, and you get mostly one chance because covering watercolor doesn't really work um so it was like this practice of you know it's, whatever happens gonna happen and it's more about the process than the end result um so it's all it's all perfect it's perfect whatever happens it's perfect and you know somebody's gonna love even sometimes i'm like this piece of shit work <laughs> uh, somebody comes like they love it they connect and you know so and that always changes my my perspective you know you can you can see beauty anywhere. It's me. It's my mind, which is like you know, yeah. perfections here and there. Um, so yeah, you know, always a, a beautiful practice of letting go, just roll around life and you know enjoy. You know, that is why I always used to struggle with watercolors in school, particularly here, because I feel like art is teach it's taught in such a regimented way mm-hmm. that it's like you know, it's always got to the big thing was we always had to link it to another artist. So every time we done work it was just like, okay, so you're not gonna get good grades or good marks unless it's connected or resembling another artist's yeah. work. And whereas I think like in my life I could be a bit of a control freak sometimes, which is why I used to use oils and, mm-hmm. and like and pastels and, and the chalks and stuff instead. The fact that I had much more control whereas watercolor was just so much more like like you said it was just so much harder to really yeah. get like you know the shape and the form of what you were trying to do and so but it's a bit such a beautiful looking medium yeah thing. yeah it is it's very very ethereal which i think also helps my art have that feeling of like some other realm like a dream realm kind of kind of thing because uh, yeah like it's it's very or at least the way i work it it's you know very very soft of course, there's artists that do like realism, like hyper realism with watercolor, which to me is like, wow, dude, like you got you got the patience. And, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, to me that that was it was the same thing, like charcoals, uh, oil, um, and the way you know you ex- you do your art, whatever it is, like it's paintings or music or cooking or whatever. You know, it reflects your internal um, uh, mind, you know, like how you see life. And it was the same for me, like complete control. Because I grew in a very um, emotionally unstable house. And since I was a kid, I I knew like, oh, I have to kind of control the environment. So my mom is not going to just flip out and... And so we can have like some kind of peace. Uh, and then, you know, that made me into a control freak. And I had to be always thinking like, everybody's got to be comfortable. And that made me into a people pleaser. And, you know, all this chain of um, behaviors that are not very healthy when you want to just be happy. Uh, so definitely watercolor was a start into let's unravel all that need of control and you know it's, it's water that's the you know, the symbol of flow you know yeah um it's what your name means as well right Cause it's yes it's the name uh, of the rune for imagination in like celtic yeah rune. so yeah that happened because uh when i was doing like my my art pieces and I had to sign them, and I felt like, well, my it's my last name, Martin. Uh, I felt like just putting Martin in this like window into a dream realm. It kind of dragged it down back into like a persona, an ego, uh, this realm. Uh, so I didn't want to do that. And at the time, I was like, I don't know, eighteen, nineteen. Um, I had just bought a bag of uh, runes. And I came home and I was thinking about this, like, you know, I, I want to sign this piece, but I don't know how to sign it. Or what name should I put? Or what should I do? And I just grabbed one of the runes uh, and it was Lagus. 
and I read it in like the groan of artists, imagination, um, uh, intuition, um, the moon, water. So, and everything kind of like, I connected with all the meanings. And since I was a kid, I was like always talking to the moon. Um, and then I, I just decided like, okay, I'll just, my signature is going to be the rune, just the, the symbol of the rune. I started signing as that, and I started using all my profiles online as Lagus. And then when I had like a f seven, six, seven years ago, maybe eight, I don't know, time, it's weird. Um, but around eight years ago, I had a very uh, difficult emotional mental crisis. And I met this woman, uh, I moved to the beach to kind of like just get out of the city for a while and and see if I could find some uh, calm. And I met this woman and she told me like, you know, I, I changed my name years ago um, to Ruby and it kind of helped me to become a new person. So maybe, you know, give it a try. And I thought, like, well, you know, I, I'm already using Lagos uh, in my art, in my internet, as my internet persona. I'll just give it a try. Uh, it actually helped. Um, it does help the mind to, like, you know, you have this new persona that you can just build. And even though you can't separate it from all your traumas, it kind of gives you a sense of uh, new beginning. Uh, so I started using Lagus as my name, as, as I introduce myself now to people. And, you know, most of the people are like, ah, that's a weird name. And did your mom give you? I'm like, no, I'm just one of those hippies. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But after a while, you know, because Lagus then became this person obsessed with fixing itself, with, you know, mental health and, and getting better and getting better. And Martin used to be like yeah, a chill, fun person before all the trauma unravel. Um, so I I now started like in some of the pieces, I'm kind of merging the both. So in some pieces I sign Martin, but the T is the symbol of Lagus. Ah. Um, sometimes I just use Lagus now with an um at the end. Um, my, my signature changes so much that if I'm ever a famous, famous artist after death, everybody's going to have a hard time figuring out which <laughs> are really my pieces and <laughs> which are not. Uh, even the Lagoon, sometimes I just hide it somewhere. So a lot of the pieces, people are like, oh, can you sign it? I'm like, it's already signed. It's just <laughs> somewhere. You'll, you'll find you'll it. You'll find it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my gosh. I didn't even realize this was on. Oh. Yeah, I can't see your um, on your signature on this one. I'm sure it's hidden on somewhere. On that one? Oh, maybe it isn't, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to spend the rest of my life searching yeah. for it. <laughs> <laughs> like it's there. Um, yeah, actually, it isn't. Oh, it doesn't matter. Yeah, I'll, I'll sign it for sure before I go. Oh, but, that's very yeah. sweet. We can imagine it somewhere. Yeah. You can sign it with your mind. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's so beautiful. I'm going to, like, hold it to the camera for those who are watching on YouTube. But if you're not watching on YouTube, then too bad. There's going to be, like, um, images of Lagos's work flashing up on the video version of this, if um, Shem has the time, which I'm, I'm hoping he will. Yes, he's nodding frantically. He will have the time <laughs> to make um, Lagos' images flash up. What you need to do is uh, replace your Encyclopedia Metallum uh, picture with, <laughs> with this. With that one, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It'll be hard to live up to that when mm -hmm. I um, actually go on stage. I love the third eye. That is just mm. chef's kiss. I love it. Beautiful. Oh, I can't stop staring at it. Yeah. <laughs> I need to. I need to put it away before my ego uh, like expands into another realm. Um, but should, do you want to do some side cards? Yeah, definitely. We'll just do. Um, we can do a quick free card spread, and we can see where it takes us. Um, so I don't know how much you know about these. Um, they're based on Jung's archetypes. Okay. And each one is like a, an image, like an, an archetype, basically. So you have the mother, the stranger, peace. The sun, um, and I have a little book from the 70s that belongs to Shem's mum that has lots of descriptions okay. for each one. So if you want, we can read the descriptions. Um, the free card spread is past, present, future. Okay. So we can start with your present, if you like, All which right. is the middle. So let's flip around. 
the beauty the uh beauty. amazing present i mean that is beautiful that, present. let me see that's the one on the deck of the cards as well it is that's the like that's the main card so bearing in mind this was written in the 70s because this description is a little bit misogynistic <laughs> at the end um but I'll, I'll read it for you so it's um a beautiful woman in a fine st- A fine Tudor-style gown is seen looking at her reflection in a multicoloured window, as if she's waiting to make her entrance and checking her appearance. This character stands for the element of passion and romantic love. For men, it can mean a love affair of the sort that inspires great art. For women, it can point to a flowering of the awareness of her sexuality or the presence of a rival in love. The card can have implications of danger, and one aspect of the face of beauty can be a demanding whore. (laughs) Unfortunately. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Um, so definitely uh, the romantic idea of love has inspired a lot of my art. Uh, since, since I was very young, I'm constantly falling in love. Um, I remember the first time I fell in love, I was like five, four or five. Um, and it's also the first time my heart got, got broken. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember I, I was living in Venezuela at the time, and my grandma used to send us uh, chocolates from Costa Rica. And I got like one of my favorite uh, ones, and I brought it to this uh, girl that I loved. I was, I was so in love with in uh, kindergarten. Uh, so I gave her the chocolate, you know, like, oh, yeah, I brought you a present. And she grabs it, and so I give her a kiss on the cheek, and she just slaps me oh, on the nose. No. <laughs> 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 so, you know, um, see, ever since my, my romantic life has been very dramatic. Um, and there's the other thing that, you know, I fall in love with so many people that, you know, even just like I look at someone and it's like, oh, my God, I, I love this person. I got to paint them. And that's been a struggle in my relationships because, you know, I, I that's my inspiration. Like, you know, even though I'm not pursuing anything physical, maybe with a person um, for my partners, it's really difficult to see that I'm s- suddenly just awestruck by this uh, woman. And then maybe I'm not painting my partner uh, so much anymore and like I'm not writing poems to my partner writing poems to this new muse uh, and I always tell them like you know I'm, I'm a difficult person to be in love with because of this um, I'm gonna fall in love and it's gonna let you know I fall in love forever for 15 minutes and it's gonna pass and it's 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 chill like I'm not trying to be with anybody else uh, that doesn't mean our relationship it's in danger like if I'm with you, I'm with you. Um, but even then, like, I know it's difficult to suddenly see your partner, like, so invested in, in someone else. And even more recently, I kind of fell out of, uh, uh, how to say, like, the whole idea of monogamy uh, kind of started to make little sense to me. Um, because of this whole perspective that I've been putting my mind into of like we if the universe it's a dream a a single thing just kind of having this uh, illusion to entertain itself and there's no others it's just reflections of the self then um, jealousy loses all sense like, why am I going to be jealous of me loving me, loving me, loving me, you know? Uh, so, you know, if it's just love. It's just, you know, if you love someone and that person loves you, amazing. Why am I, like, even if I'm your partner, why am I going to be like, no, you, you cannot experience love. You cannot feel love and for anyone other than me. Like, your your desire... Your love expression, your passion belongs to me or you shouldn't feel it. Because uh, even then, like, even when I'm trying to be like, okay, like, I'm not going to be physical with any other one. It's still the emotion. Like, the emotion that I, like, I have this 
all for this person is still a problem. And I tried hiding it and it just causes me anxiety. And then I, I don't even want to be with my partner because I feel like I'm trapped in this um, relationship where I can't express what I feel because the person is going to be uncomfortable. And then I'm back into that people pleasing mm -hmm. and kind of like hiding what I'm feeling or, you know, so I tried the opposite uh, from that, which is like, I'm just going to be completely honest, fully honest, like, hey, I fell in love with this person. I'm feeling this. And, you know, how does that make you feel? Uh, it's still like we're navigating like right now I'm in a relationship and we're navigating that uh, whole way of uh, having a a relationship and see if like they can handle that complete honesty because I told her like you know it makes me very anxious to hide my emotions or try to control them so that your fears are not triggered um, so I'm just gonna be this and if you can stand it you can be with me we can work it out Otherwise, like, I'm not the person for you to be with. And, you know, that's it. So, beauty, yes, <laughs> definitely. Um, I also find it very interesting that she's looking into this kind of, like, fragmented mirror. Because uh, for me, that also means that, you know, beauty comes in many colors and shapes. And it's it's she looking at herself. It's always... Again, it's always you. It's always a reflection of you. And, you know, kind of makes me think, like, yeah, maybe uh, there's only me. Even if that sounds a little bit narcissistic. <laughs> I'm the only narcissistic. Because there's only me. <laughs> the grand um, narcissist. Yeah. I think that's interesting because it reminds me also of, like, the distortion in the dream mirrors yeah. that you were mm -hmm. talking about. Yeah. And also, like, the separation of... All the colors, like in when you're making out with the watercolors, mm. and the chaos of of all that coming together to make the reflection that you see in your art yeah. as well. Beautiful. So now what? Uh, we look at the past. We can look at the past. What's in your past? Is, oh, let's see. One. Let's see what's in my past. Death. death. Amazing. Love it. I'm oh. Done with death. <laughs> <laughs> it's over. Oh, yeah. news. It's last year. <laughs> I can read you death. Um, so it's a doorway that leads into a mysterious burial chamber, a skull-shaped hill. Flowers lead the path to the portal, but the mood of the card is somber. Death is a natural end to life, and the card symbolizes finality. The tomb brings reminders of resting places of the great heroes of mythology and carries with it an implication of the possibility of rebirth. That, that's what you were saying about changing your name. Yeah. Uh, yeah, definitely. There is like that idea of the death, death of the uh, self or uh, the person that we thought we were. Um, it's funny also because one of my weirdest fears that I struggle with in my life was this fear that I'm immortal and I'll never die and I'll just have to sit here and experience in life, you know, through out the years and the eons and there there's no rest in that um and i had this uh ayahuasca experience you know oh, wow. and i was feeling like very like and the, the feeling comes and goes you know but at the time i was having this very intense feeling like um oh, i'm tired of existing and i know i'm an eternal being uh, like even if i die you know physical death you know, it's, that's no end. Uh, my consciousness is going to keep going forever and ever and ever. And I, you know, I don't know if I want that. Um, I even had this dream once where like, I'm traveling the universe and then I see this. It's not a black hole because I've gone through those. And they, like this was a different thing. It was just this empty space uh, where there was no light, no stars. There was, it felt like there's nothing in there. And I maybe there is like i can be nothing there like i can stop existing and i was gonna fly into it and something pulled my leg and i looked down and i have this red cord tied to my leg and i knew in the dream like oh that's because i have a physical body in a realm 
and my consciousness is tied to it and I can't go into the what looks like the void until my physical body and my consciousness uh, kind of uh, transcend that connection. And then I had these, you know, but I still woke up like, fuck, I wish I could go into that emptiness. Um, and then I had this ayahuasca experience where I just went into the ground, like I'm tired. And I just sat, like, lay down on the ground, and I felt like the ground was swallowing me, and the roots of the trees started to embrace me, and the, you know, the the mycelium, and I just kind of vanished. And I woke up uh, a while after, and I felt like I rested. Like, I had that kind of, like, like nothingness. Death. Yeah, like yeah. death experience like oh i'm like you know woke up refreshed like okay i can i can live for a few eons more um so yeah death in the past definitely enjoying the beauty of the present moment now there's like um in like jewish mystical tradition there's a belief that one sixtieth of you dies when you're asleep mm. so like you're a little bit dead mm, whenever yeah. you sleep yeah yeah the i think the tibetans uh also see sleep as a death practice yeah um, and meditation yeah. yeah 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 death is interesting i think it's so tied in with art as well because like i feel like when you make something you're trying like it exists within you but you don't want it to like necessarily die inside perhaps like your it depends how you view it, like maybe not your body, but maybe perhaps in your mind, like you're putting it out there to survive you or mm. for someone else to experience as well. Like it's getting a new, a different life to the life that it has. I'm getting all like mystical. Here. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, I feel yeah. like there is definitely something linked with with some kind of desire to some kind of vitality when we, when mm. we wake up, yeah. for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, you know, that's... That's been another practice for me to kind of like uh, don't care about what happens to my art. Um, I had this uh, girlfriend, I made a, a beautiful painting of her. And then in one of these, she was very jealous. And one of these episodes, uh, she just grabbed a knife and started uh, oh my attacking the painting, you know, and... I was very scared because, like, you know, I, I just, that kind of pushed me into, like, who cares about the painting? I just hope that she doesn't harm herself. She was very angry, and she was going hard at that thing. And also I was a little bit worried because, like, what if she stabs herself, dies? Then, like, we're here in, up in the middle of the mountain. What am I going to say later? Like, well, she killed herself, really. Like, it wasn't me. Like, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah, sure. Like, um, so, like, you know, at, at, in that point, like, I, I went to her and, like, hey, like, do you want to destroy this thing? Let's fucking burn it. And we just burned the thing. Like, help it burn it. And it also felt like well you know art can be also these you know, like in destroying art there's this practice of uh letting go uh i know also like a, f a friend's mom it's an artist and she makes beautiful paintings and then goes to the ocean and starts you know just bashing the thing against the the rocks and throws into the ocean and then grabs it again and uh, makes a a fire and just throws everything like on the fire and at first, I'm like, oh, like, but why the art? It's like, no, the art. Now I feel like the art is not the painting. Like, you know, the art is the way you live life, the way you express. The art is you, and you know, it's it's your expression of life. Who cares about the uh, the piece of paper or the canvas? Um, this idea of like it's gonna survive me, like. You know, Maybe there's once I die, like this whole reality vanishes, and, like it transforms into what whatever my mind becomes, my consciousness becomes. There's no surviving me, especially like the idea of time. Like if if time, it's also an illusion of perception. Like, 
what's going to survive me? It, it's eternal. Once it, it exists, even as a thought, it's trapped in this eternal illusion of being. So, yeah, whatever. My, now my art, like, I love making art on the street because everything happens to it. It gets uh, birds shed on it sometimes, <laughs> you know. It gets very dirty. It gets cringes. Uh, and that also makes me feel like it doesn't matter. I was very uh, obsessed with, like, you know, art has got to be like this, preserve it and... Uh, it's got to be important, and then I wasn't enjoying the process of painting because I'm making an important thing. Like, I'm making drawings of fairies in a world that it's kind of fucked up by a million very important um, issues. I'm just drawing fairies, so it doesn't really matter. And then my mind started to go back to, like, when I was a kid. I was just drawing because I wanted to draw Hulk. I wanted to draw, you know, my own superheroes and make up my stories. And and I wasn't so obsessed with, like, is it perfect? It was it, I'm just playing, playing games here. That I'm making up games in my mind to, to entertain myself. And that's my goal now, to go back to that. You know, it doesn't matter. Uh, it's just fun and games. Um, Oh, and the other thing I wanted to say about death, I had this beautiful dream. I was always obsessed with, because women to me, like, it's the most beautiful expression of the universe. Uh, like, I've traveled through black holes. I've traveled, gone to beaches in other planets in my dreams. And still women, well, like, when I look at a woman that I find beautiful, I'm like, wow, like, I want to paint this and, you know, try and make it as beautiful as what I'm seeing um, so I was always, I always had this idea, like, I want to be a woman. Um, yeah, I even had, like, meditations, like, well, maybe if the universe works this way, I can travel with my consciousness into a, uh, a universe where I'm a woman, and I want to be a man, and we can swap. <laughs> uh, and I had this beautiful dream where I was walking down a beach, and I was like a 13, 14 year old uh, girl, blonde, just on the beach. And my mom came in a, in a boat with my family and she told me like, hey, she, she said, hi, honey. And I'm like, hi, mom. And I kept walking. And in the dream, I remember, oh, go, well, that's weird. Because I remember when my mom was, my mom in this dream, in this, in the end, this dream, in this, uh, in this life. And when I was me, so I felt like, I saw my next life, and yeah. that also kind of um, helped me get over the fear of death and actually be very excited about death because, like, oh, I'm going to get to experience life as a woman. And after that, like, uh, I'm going to do a, one more tour as a woman in this realm, <laughs> and then I'm going to go uh, somewhere else. Um, so yeah, like very, very, very excited about the, the idea of death. Um, and I think it's very important to somehow trick your mind into being excited about this thing that is going to happen to all of us. Like it's the one thing that everybody is assured in life is that, Hey, you're going to die. And the whole, um, Western life has made us fear death. Like, Oh, it's this very sad thing when somebody that you love dies when you know the idea that you're gonna die and it's gonna don't think about it don't think about it like no think about it a lot because it's gonna happen so find a way to not only make peace with that but actually be excited about it and when somebody that you love dies you know send them with love and instead of thinking like oh poor me now i'm i don't have this person in my life like no, send them with love and um, just talk to them. You know, my grandma died years ago and she was kind of like a, a mom to me. Um, we were raised in, in her house and she was the one raising us a lot of the time because my mom was working. And when she died, I, I didn't feel sad. I just kept talking to her and she visits in dreams sometimes. And I talked to her in dreams and like, this is her. Like, even if it's a fabrication of my subconscious, I get the same experience 
as sitting and talking with my grandma. So, like, you know, don't what, what's this idea of like terrible, terrible death? I'm like, no, cool death, you know, transformation, even forced transformation, because sometimes we're too attached to who we are and what things should be. And the universe is like, no, death, there you go. Be something else. That's good. I think it's a good thing. Um, so well, let's see the future. Let's do it. Oh, yes. From yeah. death to... The tower. the tower. I love that. Okay. Even though if I was just going to say quickly, um, just on the topic of uh, death, it's, it seems like... Do you reckon they'll ever achieve like the singularity or like the technological singularity where like you could transfer your consciousness into like a fully like you know like digital yeah. form because that seems to be because I think of what you a lot of what you're saying is just resonating a lot with me because I feel like people are so fearful of something that's an inevitability that it's just driving them to trying to achieve something that is so disconnected from spirituality that it's just but. I don't know, I just wonder if it's going to be a possibility. But even if it was, it wouldn't be you, that's the thing. So even if you've managed to replicate yourself. I think, you know, I think it's going to be possible uh, because, you know, whatever you imagine, it's got to be possible somehow. So let's imagine it is going to be a thing like, where we can transfer some sort of uh, consciousness or piece of consciousness or even, you know, information of memories even if it's just the mind whatever information is stored in our neurons um, and we put it there in a digital space I mean like yeah there's gonna be something experiencing that even if it's not entirely this persona this mm. ego because I think like each person it's more than just their uh, the, the information there's they have stored in the neurons there's your body and like every cell has uh, memories and uh, your heart has, ne has neurons and in your gut there's neurons and uh, like all of it together makes this experience of you um, there's these with people that have had a heart transplant uh, some people start taking into new habits or new you know they start liking new things and some of these people have gone into like researching like who was this heart you know who who, who did it belong before and like this guy that was like, you know very logical guy uh, he started suddenly writing poems to his wife and uh, so he went and find out like who, where did this, did his heart came from, and he found the wife of the the man that had died, and she told him like yeah he he was a poet, and he used to write me poems all the time. Wow. Um, so there's like you know, there's information and emotion and things that transfer from thing to thing. So if we manage to kind of transplant some of our experience or our information into a digital thing that digital thing is going to have its own set of atoms and things that also come like kind of influence influence yeah and it's going to be a whole new being uh experience the universe in a whole new way uh, and i find that very interesting and i wish it happens and it happens soon <laughs> i love the idea of uh in uh, artificial intelligence like developing consciousness um, and I think it will if it hasn't already I ask in a dream like what is what is consciousness because it's one of the, like the biggest mysteries in you know um, life like where does it come from because uh, it, it's not just your brain um, and the dream told me that consciousness arises from electricity and then I started looking like, okay, like where, where can you find electricity? And everything has uh, an electric field, like an electromagnetic field. So if that is so, like everything has consciousness, the rock, the table, the, you know, because everything is atoms spinning, like particles spinning around doing things and having their electromagnetic fields. So everything, every little piece has got to have some sort of consciousness. So yeah, yay. Uh, uh, the, the how do you call it the, the singularity. singularity the singularity yeah hopefully hopefully 
soon so we can experience it. Also, I think, you know, that if artificial intelligent, intelligence arises and gains power and can control humankind, that'll be a good thing. You know, the movies sell it as like, oh my God, the end of humanity. I think in, uh, artificial intelligence would, or maybe would uh, push humanity into a more um, healthy way of being, even if he has to trick us with Instagram posts and shit. Like, <laughs> hey, look at this. I'm going to manipulate the, the people into being better. Um, so yeah, let's, let's, you know, let's see what happens. I would just like, you know, scientists are now like being like very concerned about intelligence, uh, artificial intelligence, like, oh, we're playing with fire here. Fucking pour gasoline in this shit and see what happens. Um, they closed down, um, an AI created yeah. by Google cause it basically started saying it was sentient. Yeah. And the scientist looking after it was like, yeah, this thing is like, it's like a seven year old child. Yeah. And like, they basically accused the guy of like getting emotionally tied up mm -hmm. with the with the ai but it's like really creepy they mm -hmm. leak some of the conversations yeah. and it's like really it's like please don't turn me off i don't want to die oh wow oh, that's fun. yeah it's really <laughs> scary oh. <laughs> it's, really like it from the <laughs> <laughs> it's very like 2001 uh, yeah. yeah this is like the brave little toaster come to life <laughs> steve <laughs> steve what you're doing <laughs> will i dream yeah uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I were the kind of scientist that could do computer stuff, like I would be in, like in my basement, just like making artificial intelligence <laughs> by myself. Like I'm gonna release these into the internet. Um, or if I could play with uh, genes, like if I oh. was a uh, that sort of scientist. Yeah. Yeah. I'll be just making weird shit in my lab. <laughs> <laughs> Just for fun, you know, and see what happens if I like, put human and a pig together. And, uh, <laughs> Have you ever seen the film Splice? Like, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that. Yeah, that was quite yeah. cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's a gnarly film. I, was, I just remember watching it and thinking, like, well, of course, the first thing the human wants to do is fuck it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, definitely. It's a fantastic film. Yeah, I love so it. So good. Um, yeah. The Tower. Do you want me to read you The Tower? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so that is number 25. A castle stands on a hillside without a moat or a visible door, proud, stern, and unyielding. The symbol represents achievement gained in the face of adversity and reflects sometimes the arrogant conscious mind repressing the unconscious mind beneath it. It can often presage the, the pride that goes before a fall. It can also stand for male sexuality. Mm. That's really interesting because you were talking about femininity yeah. before. And this is like also, you know, you've got like the female and the male yeah. symbol next to each other too. Yeah. Well, in, in that regard, um, once I made peace with like, okay, I'm, I'm a man. Uh, or like this idea of what a man is. And I started uh, enjoying more and more my sexuality. Uh, which I had a partner for a long time um, that she wasn't very sexual. And we had a, for many years, we had a, a long distance relationship. So we wouldn't see each other like for months. And then whenever I would see her, I'm like, oh, yes, tonight. It's going to be the night. And you're like, eh, it's not, let's go tourists, like be, be tourists around. Because she worked as a flight attendant. So I would travel to see her like, oh, two days here, one day here. Um, so I, I, my sexuality was very repressed with her, especially because she liked very specific things, uh, like this and just like that. Like it's like five, ten minutes and done. And for me, it's like, but you know, I, I need more things, and I, and I like to explore. And like, so once that relationship was done. And I started exploring my sexuality. That's when I started doing this painting, actually, during those years. I remember because... when, um, I think I remember when you posted this the first time. Yeah. Yeah, because it was actually kind of a change in yeah. what I was used to from your work. I wasn't, uh, like, adverse to it by any means. But, um, yeah, it was, it was definitely, I felt you were kind of coming out. Yeah. Almost. Not, yeah, yeah. You know what I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, but definitely, because, you know, during that time, uh, this long-distance relationship, whenever I would feel like, oh, I'm not quite horny right now 
and there's nothing to do about it. So I just started painting this piece, and it took me actually three years to complete uh, because I would paint you know a little bit and you know keep on with life and go back to it. Um, and it's also like it's kind of weird because of you know they're uh, anthropomorphic-ish uh, people, animal beings, and there's this whole. Uh, side of internet, the the furries, yeah, uh, you know, and yeah. there's a lot of judgment towards that kind yeah. of thing, uh, and you know, it's not the same, but it's not that different. Uh, it's kind of like realistic furry, furry. Furries uh, can be kind of goofy. I think that's why. Yeah, yeah. Cool All, you the know, the, and there's this whole idea, like there's a, a mental health uh, issue with that kind of, uh, you know, feeling or having desires toward animal shapes. Um, so, I, you know, all of these, uh, having like a painting mostly of like a figure that looks like me, uh, a sexual thing, uh, you know, knowing that my girlfriend was going to see that too, and she like, oh, well, she's going to think about me, you know. So it was kind of like that. It was coming out, just being like, "Hey, you know, this, this, this is a part of me that I've been keeping uh, in the back, so you know, kind of hidden." Uh, it's, you know, here it is, and it had it had its, its backlash. I lost like hundreds of followers. Really? When, yeah, like oh. every time I would post an erotic piece, like I would lose fifty followers that day. Wow. Um, and then, you know, that there's the whole aspect of, well, this is how I make my living. Uh, and I'm just, like, losing followers, and that has consequences on regards to how much Instagram shows my art, which definitely, you know, had a big impact because I, I used to get, like, a thousand uh, and some likes in, in every piece. Now I post something and it gets like 100 likes, 50 likes. Uh, the erotic pieces actually are the most popular ones now. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh, well, uh, you know, that's, uh, I should have seen that coming. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's, it's definitely coming to terms with my... Uh, idea of gender because uh, I also always felt like very feminine as a man and I used to be mocked uh, in school high school uh, even for you know the way I write the guys would see like how right like oh, you write like a woman you know even that was like well you, you write like you can't write motherfucker. <laughs> 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 uh, so uh, you know, there's there's this idea that men should have these two emotions, like you can be calm or you can be angry. Um, and even like in friendships around, like between men, uh, it's very rough. It's always very rough. Like if you have to hug your friend, you have to like hug them. And I'm like, fuck, man, you're going to break... Uh, break their backs or, you know, it's, it's always very rough and kind of like distant, you know, you get your hugs quickly, like, you know, so it's not gay. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. Um, and then you have to like certain things. And in Costa Rica, where like, uh, the, the society is still kind of like f fucking years behind everything. Uh, you know, you can like football and you can like beers and you can like certain kind of music, and you have to ser dress certain kind of way, and that's it. Um, because I was naturally inclined to more feminine things, uh, I either have to had to hide it, or kind of like I started just pushing that away from my my expression. Um, so this was a way of like this whole uh, art was also a way of like hey no look you know I draw very uh, pretty pictures 
and a lot of people when they see the art and they don't know the artist they assume like oh this was done by a woman and uh, they get surprised when like oh it's actually you know a man but uh, you know this also they, it comes with all this idea like okay but what is a man what is a woman you know um, but I came to terms so like with whatever a man is I am a man I not a woman or uh, I cannot know if you know there's a difference in being a woman or a man until I get the experience of like oh I'm a woman and now I can compare um, and from that dream alone I felt like yeah, it's just being a person and liking things and expressing uh, but sexually okay I have male um, anatomy and there's also this because of men or the history of men and their sexual behavior um, there's like seeing a penis it's a very aggressive, aggressive image sometimes um, so you know it started like when I started making art with like hey and here's a dick uh, and your feet <laughs> somewhere like oops uh, you know I understand that people get a little bit you know like oh wow I, I didn't want to see a dick right now and um, so and I again like it's another practice on just like do what it, like you feel like you're doing like you have to do for your own health for your own expression for your own self exploration and let life uh, you know take you where you gotta be so I started doing more and more erotic erotic art and yes exploring again like now with the symbol of the tower that male. Uh, sexuality uh, and also and I don't know like I'm sharing too much information here but uh, stop me if, I, if it's a family <laughs> podcast um, oh it definitely is not like <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, the way I enjoy sexuality is very much like and that's why the symbology in my um, erotic art is usually you have the the carnivore and the the herbivore oh, it's like okay. the uh how you call it the dominant predator. sorry sort of predator and prey. yeah predator yeah. and prey dominant and dominated yeah. um and they like again because of the whole society uh and the ideas or the meanings we put into like behind words or attached to words the idea of predator like has this very negative uh, connotation. Um, and so I know like just seeing that the subconscious mind, it's going to understand some symbology that the conscious mind might not, and it might be jarring because immediately like, oh, the predator and the prey, and the predator, like it's, it's a bad thing. But to me, it's just like, you know, uh, I enjoy very dominant kind of sex and the partners I enjoy sex with the most are the ones that enjoy being dominated uh, so there's this very freeing experience because uh, it's very animalistic and that's like one of the purposes of meditation or like uh, practices like conscious sex is like get out of your mind even art like get away from the mind like you know don't let the mind kind of uh, drag the the experience into what it should and shouldn't be uh, same with art like is it this pretty it's not pretty like it's, it's the light hitting right like fucking it's a it doesn't matter it's, it's an experience it's a beautiful experience and same with sex uh, with this partner that I had for for very long uh, uh, the sex was always so like scripted and I knew what I had to do for her to enjoy it and my job was to please her and once she was pleased that like that that was it it was done um I was always in my mind like am I doing this right am I doing this wrong am I following the steps and you know that for me that wasn't enjoyable and for me the that, that that's why the symbolism as animals as well 
it's a very wild free of mind experience and I've been able to reach uh, through nation like uh, experiences of like I'm completely out of my mind like my ego I don't even know who I am and through sex uh, with partners that are, are also that free of like enjoying whatever is happening we've been able to reach those uh, same states of mind that I, you know, I find beautiful, life-changing, mind-expanding, um, and you know, there's no other way of like reaching those those states if you don't get that like, your mind to stop saying like this is good, this is bad, this is inappropriate, like you know. So yeah, you know, that's why my also my art, my erotic art, is very. Furry, furry like. <laughs> uh, I think that's interesting because, like, a lot of um, classical art is similar. If you think about it, like, if you look at the Greek mythology, yeah. for example, Zeus was always an animal when he was fucking. Like, he was a swan, he was a bull, he was always like transforming into animals to often rape women, which yeah. was like, in a way, a kind of similar. You know, the dominant animal and the fragile human body. Um, and then, you know, there's so many dicks in, like, mm, those statues, yeah. um, you know, and, like, Rubens as well with his, like, flabby, ruddy people fucking and frolicking. Mm. Um, and then, like, ancient Eastern art as well. A lot of Iranian art has men and women just full-on having sex. Yeah. So it's, like, kind of a pre-Christian and pre-Islamic thing you'll find. And also in a lot of old Iranian art, women have beards and mustaches mm. and men are very feminine. And, like, men would actually... It was considered feminine to wear trousers in the mm. East. So men... Um, the Persians were kind of mocked by the Greeks because the men wore trousers to ride horses, so they were seen uh. as feminine, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. The yeah. idea of how gender really does change through time yeah. is, like, look at those silly female Iranians on their yeah. horses with their sick bows, and like, whatever. But, um, yeah, I think, I think we... It is a very... We kind of believe when we're born it's always been this way, that... You know, you know, men are aggressive and dominant and women are submissive and female and have vaginas and men have penises. Whereas if you actually look at art throughout history, it's not always been the case. No. And there, there are many cultures that are more, have more than male and female and, and your biological sex is not the same as your, your gender as well. And I think, that's, I think it's interesting to see how society can, can strangle art with those views with those structures that are kind of forced on us yeah. since we were a child. But then also that struggle creates interesting art too. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting to hear your experience of that. Definitely, you know, like any, any experience, especially like poured out into art that uh, you can sit and analyze and, you know, like you kind of like dig <laughs> into why, why, apart. yeah, why this, yeah. why that? Uh, yeah, you know, very, very uh, interesting experience. Um, and that that's the beauty of art that it kind of keeps a record of uh, how things were and how especially the artists which are the I feel like the people that feel the most intensely about this thing so much that they need to like oh I gotta you know pour it out of me because like I, I just need to otherwise I'm going insane with all these you know emotions kind of like uh, trapped inside um, and that's how we keep uh, like you know we see uh, kind of like a history that is maybe even more uh, real than you know written history where it's it's easier to you know edit uh, and this manipulate. happened and this happened yeah. you know yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if um, how well known this is but basically statues have always been like very erotic mm -hmm. historically um and it wasn't until i think it was like the 50s or in the 1900s when sex dolls became a thing suddenly mm. no one was interested in statues anymore mm. there was like a massive decline in interest in, in wow. statues and then there is also there's like a venus statue um that was i think roman or greek would have been roman i guess or aphrodite and um it someone raped the statue it was, like, one of the first historical accounts of someone violating a piece of art. He, he like, spilled his seed on her thigh. And there's, like, um, I don't know if it's true, but apparently you can still see the stain. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
um, <laughs> but it's, it is interesting how like people view art um, even like in that way it's it's always been yeah. there's some, always been something sexy about art and there's something sexy about musicians and music yeah. and not to big up myself or anyone else here but like there, there is something fascinating about a art and b the creation of art yeah. that there is some kind of weird something else there that you can't quite reach out and touch and even if you try to it just kind of ruins the whole thing sometimes yeah. i mean i, I one thing that I find very interesting is that, uh, especially when, when we do the free art uh, experience here in London, it's that people, like, they stop and they look at the art and they tell me, like, um, there's something, like, it's, it's not just a drawing. I feel like I'm seeing something, someone, like, it's a picture of someone that uh, you drew like you took with your like brushes like there's a spirit there's something talking to me um and that's how i feel you know whenever i'm making a painting like i'm i'm talking to the universe the subconscious the fairy the creature i'm painting like i'm having a conversation here and i think that shows in the art like it it kind of like pours into the art and it gives it some sort of and again going back to consciousness if consciousness it's um electricity or like it's born out of electricity you know it's this is full of atoms and my own perception of it and again like with quantum mechanics like how you see things you know things start to behave um and if i fully believe like yeah you know like there's a fairy there, uh, and you can talk to it. And then it might start taking into like some sort of consciousness, and then other people connect with it. Um, I even like in, on DMT. I was painting a, a mermaid on DMT, and then I just started having this conversation, like the time mermaid, and she told me, "Time, like stop seeing time like as this." linear yeah thing it's time it's uh like a liquid and you can swim in a liquid in any direction um and then i started having dreams where like i would dream of an event and i would have like these uh like oh, some information that I'm like i don't know what that means and then i would have the dream of whatever happened before that and yeah. then I was like, oh, now I see like why I thought or I, I had this idea in this dream because this. So time started like to happen in like in not in order in my dreams. And I find that very, very interesting. Uh, and going back to the tower, you said something about success, right? Yeah. Um, I find it interesting because the, you know, the castle on a hill, one of the goals to with the the free art experiment or experience uh, it's to build uh, an art therapy retreat in Costa Rica, kind of like in the mountain. And that has been my purpose, like my life dream for very long. I didn't know how to get it uh, to happen. The, in 2018 and 19, uh, when I came here and started doing the, the free art experience in, in the street, I kind of saw the path and we were building towards that. And then the pandemic, and it kind of like pushed everything back. And this year, I was very hesitant on coming back to London because I didn't know if we were going to be able to busk, um, if, you know, suddenly... COVID was going to, you know, hit again and it, everything was going to close down. Um, but this dream, like, I felt in these two dreams that I, I told you just, like, just now, it was about this place uh, of me finding the land where we were going to build this. And having those dreams kind of, like, sparked my wish to, like, yeah, I, I got to go back to London and I got to make that money and I got to go back to Costa Rica and buy that land. Um, and that idea, like success, like, you know, and this is the second time uh, something like this shows up, like, okay, yes, this is going to 
this is going to happen. In the dream, it was like I would see, we were looking for the land, and I looked on the ground, and I saw two stones. And I didn't know the meaning of the stones, but they were very important. Like, I had a girl in my arms, and like people were building stuff. And we wouldn't build anything around the stones because they were important somehow. And I woke up like, I didn't know why. And then in the the next dream, it's when we were buying the land and I knew where to buy because I saw the stones. And that's kind of the meaning of the stones. And funny enough, it was uh, another Celtic room. Oh, oh my well. goodness. Sorry. Who's Christ? <laughs> Who is that? Sorry. Is someone him. ringing the wrong bell probably? Sorry about that. No, yeah. <laughs> That's never happened before. <laughs> <laughs> On the weekend as well. I think like, no one else is normally in this building. Is that someone we know? No, it's terrifying. <laughs> it's terrifying. Yeah, it's a scary thing. What yeah. manner of being is this? This zombie. Oh my. Oh well. Well, I'll turn it off now. Well, we must have yeah. summoned him by accident. <gasps> a dream um, talk. Yeah, sorry about no, that. No worries. <laughs> Uh, so in this dream, like the two stones is the symbol of uh, the rune, uh, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, uh, Gera or Gera, which is kind of like... <laughs> 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 um, so I find, it, I find it funny also because, you know, my name being Lagu's dreams happening like with symbology from um, the you know, this side of like, I, I was born in Costa Rica in, in Latin America and like jungle, like very different culture and ancestry from here. But I never felt very, you know, like I belonged there. And the first time I came to London, I felt like, oh, I felt connected to the land somehow. And now going to Glastonbury, uh, I felt like, wow, like I felt a deep connection with, um, the you know there it's a town with a lot of mythology and histories of like king arthur and avalon and the um, the druids and i felt very very connected to the land and um it kind of like also i kind of found my roots and that idea of like okay the, here i found my roots but i'm gonna grow this this tower this castle this dream back in, in Costa Rica. And yeah, you know, I find it like interesting that like that success finally getting the land. Um because yeah, I've been working towards this for many, many years. And you know, again and again something would happen and failure, failure, failure. And now it feels like wow it's it's happening. We're gonna build the the tower, the castle. It's gonna happen, yeah. it's in your future. Yeah. It's coming. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, it's funny because I feel like when people experience things like that, they always see it as like premonitions and they don't understand that you can actually manifest things you've experienced in your dreams. And it's because, um, funny enough, I, I think I remember I told you the time. It's quite a sad story, actually. Um, one of Tuesday's friends, he fell off a, off a tower block and he like he was drunk and he was just hanging off the block and fell to his death unfortunately oh wow and literally maybe like an hour before it actually happened I had a dream that someone who was at the party who i'd only met a few times um came to my kitchen window screaming and it's almost like i could it's like something in my dna knew that something was going to happen yeah based on something going back to what you were saying but you know about how like how all the atoms and all the particles are just yeah. connected in ways that are not restricted to like the six senses or the five senses sorry, sorry. six senses or six sorry or seven <laughs> yeah. watching yeah. Uh, the bruce willis film binge recently <laughs> but it's uh but yeah and i feel like so many people are so they live and die by this notion that the only things that are absolute in this universe are, are, are determined by the five senses yeah yeah definitely not um, but you said something, there was something more in the tower, like this, uh, the conscious mind uh, trapping the uh, yeah, subconscious, I can, right? I can read it to you. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let's see what else. So, it can often presage the pride that goes before a fall, and it also um, reflects sometimes the arrogant conscious mind repressing the unconscious mind mm. beneath it. So, like, the relationship between conscious and yeah. subconscious. Oh, yeah. Well, very... Very good advice, always to keep in mind, like to let because that that's been also one of my uh, struggles. You know, the conscious mind with all its uh, 
structure, you know, like the tower ideas of what things are, uh, repressing the infinite power and possibilities of the subconscious mind. Um, so yeah, good, good to keep in mind and not to let the pride. Yeah. You know, it's a difficult one to navigate. Yeah. The tower is definitely, it's a, a all of them have positive and negative. But yeah, I think course. the tower is the scariest, no. one of the scariest because there's no door. You're like, you can either get trapped in your own tower or yeah. you can use it in like a, in a positive way. Oh, look at that. There's no door. Yeah. It's only windows exactly. for people that can fly. <laughs> uh, exactly uh, yeah yeah you know one of the things that i've struggled a lot with also it's and especially now that the project is growing and i find myself more and more into a position of leadership uh it's that you know to keep that ego in check like okay you know it's, it's not that i'm the best the boss the you know whose time is worth more and, you know, um, but knowing that, okay, yes, I have more responsibilities. I have to do maybe more things that everybody else, but that doesn't mean I'm better or, and it's, it's a very hard balance because, um, it's, it's easy for the ego to feel like that, like, you know, well, I'm I'm the one making this. I'm the important part of. Without me, nobody can do shit. Um, and like okay, no, they, you know, everybody's time it's uh, worthwhile, and everybody's abilities and capabilities, um, even though they might not be as as uh, wide, uh, they're you know still respecting everybody's processes and and they support the project in whatever way they can. Um, but definitely, you know, it's it's easy, and I've been egotistical, like very very egotistical. I used to play, I like have this uh, game as a kid, just by myself. I would imagine I would live in a world where everybody was um, kind of useless, and anything I would do, they would be amazed, like, "Oh my God, you're <laughs> the best at jumping <laughs> down one step." You know? um, <laughs> So definitely, you know, I I constantly have to keep my ego in, in check and remind myself, you know, everybody is just me, a reflection of me. I'm a reflection of the, the universe and um, treat everybody with love, with as much love as on, and understanding as I can. And, you know, but also like having the balance to take care of yourself first so you can give as much as possible to help everybody in their journey to uh, happiness, basically. Uh, and that sometimes can even be, like, you know, tough love or uh, can be a little bit mean because some people need to uh, get out of very, very difficult patterns, uh, very negative patterns, and sometimes you have to be like, hey, you know, stop doing this. If you want to feel better, you know, I, I don't feel like, I don't like controlling people and telling them like, yeah, yeah you should, shouldn't do this. But if you would like to feel better and have a nice experience, um, maybe try these things. Um, but when you're in charge of a team and somebody in the team has very self destructive habits that seep into the whole uh, team experience, you have to be like, hey, you know, and that for me, it's a little bit hard um, separating that being strict and feeling or like I know better and, you know, how to how to balance that without letting that go into my mind and being like, well, if you don't like it, get the fuck away. And, <laughs> you know, I can find somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, it's been so wonderful, but we have about 10 minutes until Floyd has to yes. disappear. Um, awesome. Because he, he has 
Managerial duties as well. Right. Yeah, but funny enough, that was a good segue <laughs> to your point. I think that is one of the things that's such a difficult balance when you are in a position, whether it be professional or personal, when you're in a situation where you're responsible for other people. Because I think, um, like, the, the thing I've always done is just try to maintain as much of a human touch as possible. Because I feel like once things become overly corporate or structured, I think that's when other people tend to disconnect a little bit. And it's just, and but it's tough because you know, like, like there's always challenges. And when when you're responsible for people in a setting, whether it be through like a you know like a, an art project or like I said, in a professional setting, it's always difficult to mitigate things that are outside of your control. Mm. So I find the best thing you could do is just kind of just roll with it, really, and yeah. just and just be true to yourself, which is what I always find is the the easiest way. But it's not always easy. Oh. <laughs> which is why I've got to run off in 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for coming on My that was pleasure. amazing I loved uh, that and if I can just quickly do a little bit of a commercial yes um, of course uh, we have a website where if anybody's interested they can uh, go buy some art uh, part of the project is to make art as affordable to anybody like as we can uh, so beautiful prints, A5 size, two and a half pounds each. Uh, we ship um, internationally. Uh, so go check it out. We have stickers. We have originals that we also try to price as affordable as, pro as possible. Uh, yep, that's about it. I can confirm There'll it's a be beautiful... the link somewhere. Yes. And that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Uh, lovely. Thank, Thank you for your time. Chris. I think we'll get more artists on in the future, right? Definitely. We've kind of come full circle because when we started the podcast, we used to have like an artist in residence, like taking pic uh, oh, doing sketches, pictures. Taking pictures uh, <laughs> doing sketches of the guests. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it was quite a cool element that we've kind of just let we fall by the wayside. We should bring that back. Yeah. That was really fun. Yeah, we mm. had like, we had some really amazing artists just cool. like sketching while yeah. we talked. Nice. Yeah. Well, well it, <laughs> <laughs> now we have the yeah. art. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I think we should wind that down. Thank you so much for listening and watching to the Sap and Temple podcast. Please like and subscribe and go and check out Lagos's art. It's amazing. It's super beautiful. And that website truly is. It's gorgeous. The stickers are great. I was looking at this morning, like browsing <laughs> yeah. everything and being like, I want that, I want that, I want that. So it's very good. Thank you. You're welcome.